This is Margaret Lash, and this is a very special episode of The Power of X-Men. Boom! Welcome to Power of Marvel Legends, the YouTube channel where we review every single one of the very articulate, highly posable, incredibly sought out action figures known as Marvel Legends. Shout out to the Powers of X-Men podcast, Dayspring and Flinkman. Madrox, do you know what today is? I don't know, but I feel some sort of dread i think it's connected to what today is but, but i i think i know what you're alluding to as well so don't worry if people out there are scared that it's halloween and that ghosts are walking the earth we have something even better to celebrate today the 30th anniversary of the x-men animated series i cannot even fathom that number i mean the impact this series has had for 30 years at this point it, it blows my mind it blows my mind and we're still talking about it in such a way that we did back in like the early 90s like i still get excited talking about it about the characters and we have x-men 97 coming out next year so it's like the series still feels very much alive it does not feel 30 years by any means and on the flip side of it you have Obviously, the Lee Walds um, came up with a couple books on it. It's something that you can actually study seriously and academically from a number of different points of view, um, be it from TV history or comics history or um, even X-Men history. There are so many different aspects that people are really taking it seriously and diving into it and having serious discourse about it, which is, again, something that's so cool about something that we grew up with and now another generation is being exposed to through Disney Plus and watching it with their parents or just watching it themselves. Well, and piggybacking off of what you said about looking at this through television history and sort of the things that were happening behind the scenes, we know that a certain TV executive by the name of Margaret Lush laid her job on the line for the series to come into fruition. And, you know, here at Power of X-Men, we like to get the full story on everything. So today being the 30th anniversary, we thought we need to bring in the woman who made X-Men happen. She made X-Men a thing she for did. us, among many other cartoons, but we're going to focus on the X-Men. So guys at home, we have Margaret Lesh herself on the podcast today, and it is a super duper crossover with X Factor Files podcast, Daryl, which, by the way, in the interview, I wonder if she noticed that I, I toggled back between calling him Daryl and Matrox, which is your muted name. Yes, here. yes. And I, uh, I did the same thing between uh, Paul and Dayspring as well. Um, because I, you really don't want to throw guests either <laughs> with nicknames. So, um, she was, perfect with it she didn't did not phase her at all that we would have mutant names um such an enjoyable conversation um something that surprised me that folks will hear is just how long she really wanted to bring x-men out to the people um that it was really a passion project for her and um as you referenced she was involved with so much i really consider her one of the curators of my childhood that she was part of so many things that I, they're part of the fabric of my being and in my own development. So um, it was such a joy to sit down with her and um, chat with her for over an hour about things, mostly X-Men, but we, I mean, it, it's you and me. So we go off the beaten trail and we ask questions and um, she was such a fun person to chat with. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity. Gem in the Holograms, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, Muppet Babies, Batman, Power Rangers, she is responsible for all of that. And there was no one else but you. I I, I knew the interview was going to be great. 
when when you were like, yes, I can do it. I was like, let's do this right now. We have a great conversation about exactly what you said, about all the years it took for her to get the X-Men on the air. And it starts all the way back to Stan Lee coming to Hanna-Barbera and, and pitching the thing and her starting that relationship with Stan and then fast forward like 11 years later and we and we get the X-Men animated series after years of failed pitches. Oh, but you know what really, what, it was so funny. You know when you think like the universe put you exactly where you needed to be with a specific someone? When she mentioned, oh yeah, we had the thing for Hanna-Barbera. I was like, I don't remember this at all. But you and I have been talking about the thing and, and sort of brainstorming future episodes. And I was like, this is going to be a good time. Yeah, the second you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, uh, just a tease that Dayspring and I do have some ideas for some future episodes. And one of them definitely involves the thing. And we can touch on now why he was so big in the early 80s and incorporate some of the stuff she referenced that you and I never even knew was around. So uh, I felt so embarrassed when she see like, I think we did it for a season. I don't know. I was like, I don't even know if it, it exists. So let me do a quick Google search right here. And I see Fred and Barney meet the thing. I'm like, that is as Hannah Barbera as you can have her. Yeah, it is right there. Yep. So uh, um, I hope that everyone enjoys this conversation. It gave me so many new insights into things that I've read about or heard on other podcasts or other people talk about. It gives me such a deeper appreciation for everything that we got through X-Men, the animated series. And just one final note before we get into our interview with Margaret, she also talks about James Cameron and a specific Marvel movie he may or may not have been involved in in its early inceptions. And it's just kind of curious how he sort of, you know, talking about Marvel and DC movies not being really good. Well, mm. you know, mm. Mm. you know, so, you know, listen and enjoy this interview with Margaret. We are both very proud of it. Yeah. And if anyone, we say this at the end of the episode, but I'll say it right here too. If you want to reach out to Margaret, let her know anything. You can channel those through Paul. Um, just message the Power of X Men account, and he can pass those on to Margaret because she's not super active on social media, but she really would love to hear from you as well. So if you have any kudos or anything like that, shoot them on over, and we can make sure that she sees what you're saying. Okay, first of all, this is why I love it when you guest host, because you hit all of the appropriate housekeeping items, because I'm just like, ah, just let it roll. <laughs> the other thing we have to do are socials. You can hit me up at Power of X-Men. Daryl, where can people hit you up and find your podcast? And what exciting things do you have coming up for your podcast? Yeah, find us on Instagram, X Factor Files Podcast. And we are doing an issue by issue reading of X Factor Investigations. So, um, it's so much fun. We are just off of Messiah Complex right now and moving forward. So um, after you're done listening to Power of X-Men, come on over, listen to one of our episodes or more and join in the fun with us too. Binge it. You and Philip, you give great podcasting. I am so proud to be your contemporary. Oh, thank you so much. All right. So here's our interview with Margaret. Enjoy it. Margaret, today is 30 years since the X-Men animated series debuted on Fox. Did you have any idea that 30 years later we were going to be here talking about the series? <laughs> no, I had no idea. First of all, 30 years, boy, that's gone by really fast. Um, no, I, I, you know, I believed in the project. I believed it would be successful. I had a, a goal in mind of the, of trying to make our programming more, not I don't want to use the word sophisticated, but make it broader in appeal so that we get adults and kids. In other words, get the Marvel fans as well as kids. And I thought that would be successful because that would be different from what the other, our competition was, was striving for. But no, I had no idea it would become such a favorite. And I, I'm I'm sort of overwhelmed by the response that I often get, uh, especially given the amount of criticism I had for doing the show. So, who knew? Oh, we know you got some criticism for the show because the Leewalds have written extensively about it, and yeah. 
I think all of us just owe you a big thank you today You're on welcome. this anniversary. You're welcome. <laughs> Every time I see a movie, a new X-Men movie come out or a movie inspired by X-Men, I go, aha, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, we, we, we wish they would be following your format for everything, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what's on the horizon. But, you know, one of the things, not just X-Men, though, I mean, you had a hand in so many beloved animated shows. And what you were talking about widening your target audience, I mean, that's something that the Lee Waltz also discussed in their book, that you don't write down to children, you write up to children. And you yourself have said, what is family programming? Family programming is something that's for adults, but appropriate for kids. And right. I, I look at the, the, the programs you've done that I'm so obsessed with, Muppet Babies, that song still lives rent free in my head, Gem in the Holograms, I mean, the misfits were awful human beings, and that's what made them so salacious as villains. But I think that stamp of approval you did, you, you put on your shows, just really elevated the material and is still enduring with people like me and Daryl today. Well, thank you for that. I, I have to say that when I grew up in the, in the 50s, we didn't have a lot of animation. Uh, children's programs per se. There were local programs. One of the local programs when I, my dad was in the service, he was in the Air Force, so we moved quite a bit. And he had several tours of duty in Washington, D.C. at the, or at the Pentagon. So we lived in, in uh, Virginia for a while. We didn't have a TV initially, but we would go to friends' houses where they, we go to a friend's house where all the kids in the neighborhood would come and congregate in the living room on Saturday morning and we'd watch Roy Rogers and Gene Autry and Cook LaFran and Ollie and Howdy Doody and all those shows. But the show that the most, and I, I love them all, but the show that inspired me the most was a local TV show in Washington, D.C. with two unknowns called Jim and Jane Henson with these sock puppets. One of them was Kermit. And as I said, it was a local TV show and it was, they had, it looked like virtually no money. And it was, when you, on first blush, it looks like a little kid's show, but it was a little kid's show. It had very broad humor. And it also had a lot of slapstick and a lot of, you know, throwing each other across the stage. The puppets would hit each other and battle and go after each other. And they had very funny relationships. And I just loved it. And not only did I love it, but my father would laugh when he'd sit and watch it with me. We'd both be laughing, maybe for different reasons, but that show I never forgot. I mean, obviously I didn't forget any of them actually. Years later when I met Jim Henson, of course, I had to tell him what inspired me and why. And he got a big kick out of the fact that what I love the most about the show, besides the level of humor, was the slapstick that there was no holds barred there weren't broadcast standards people saying no no don't do that no no it was they were allowed to do anything they wanted and they got very outrageous and very funny so i i think that um i grew up when we didn't have a lot of options for animation we, the only animation i ever saw was when we went to the theater and of course everybody loved the theatrical shorts that were in the theater everybody moms dads adults kids tex avery chuck free i mean chuck freeze tex avery uh uh frizz freeling chuck jones all those great animators made us laugh our heads off and that to me was what kids programming should include was that kind of humor that's what inspired me so uh, before i kick it to Madrox, I need to I need to understand this. Are you saying Beta Kermit the Frog is what inspired little Margaret to become the powerhouse <laughs> she is today, but also her approach to the X-Men? Well, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it might be an overstatement. What uh -huh. the kinds of elements that were in Kermit with the humor. But the action that was in Saturday morning, which was mostly live action, as I said, uh, 
was fantastic. I mean, a lot of it were Westerns. A lot of it today would not be acceptable because of negative stereotypes of Indians and so forth. But they were filled with, with uh, conflict and jeopardy and excitement and no holds barred. It wasn't, it wasn't um, washed down to the elements of, you know, let's not, let's not create fear or anxiety in kids. It was, let's excite the kids and get them on the edge of their seats and we'll have all these cowboy rape, you know, fights and so forth. So I guess what I'm saying, what inspired me was that all of these creators were not, were unfettered. They just did what they did based on their talents and I got to enjoy them. And I carried that forth with me uh, I, in order to position Fox kids differently, I thought, let's go after the whole family. Let's go after boys and girls. Let's mix action and comedy. Those are all the things that I loved from when I was a kid. And uh, I mean, I could go on forever about Jim Hens Henson, his impact, obviously, with Sam and Friends with you and uh, really mm -hmm. him reimagining what you just said, family entertainment. If you look at The Muppet Show in the 70s and 1980, like that was something for the entire family. So just like your experience was growing up in the local DC market, he brought to the entire world. Then you took your experiences growing up and created our childhoods for us too. Um, and if anyone's interested out there listening who doesn't know a whole lot about Jim Henson, there's actually a fantastic biography by Brian J. Jones, all about Jim Henson, um, coming up from the local DC market and then becoming who we know and love. Um, but right. to get back to you, so uh, your approach in making X-Men and with your mindset of sort of revolutionizing animation and growing it up a little, um, how did you envision the audience for X-Men? So when you're thinking about it, there's this concept coming from comic books. How do I make it for the entire family? What's your thought process? Well, that's a great question. Um, obviously, it wasn't just my process. I tapped into my team, Sydney Iwater, and uh, uh, my programming team, and we would talk about this. Um, but I, listen, one of my favorite shows growing up that wasn't on Saturday morning that I watched with my father religiously, we both loved it, was Sea Hunt, starring Lloyd Bridges, probably a show you've never heard of. Sea Hunt was an action drama. Lloyd Bridges played uh, a scuba diver, and there were all these adventures with him underwater and above water, obviously. It was jeopardy. There was real risk. There was danger. It didn't talk down to me. I enjoyed it. My dad enjoyed it. I think for the same reasons because it was exciting. I really believed, and I remember we were the fourth network. We were coming on against all odds. I wanted a show to appeal to boys and girls. I wanted it not just to be the Marvel fan, but people who had never, kids who had never heard of it. I wanted to counter program. And so my thought process was, here's this wonderful comic with years and years of sources of stories and great characters. It was a drama. That's what I liked about it. It was a drama. It wasn't just a boy's adventure show. And I thought there's a place for drama. There's a place for, I loved the comics. Stan is the one that inspired me. And, and you know the story that I tried for years to sell it and was not successful. I had to go start a network with Fox to get the show on the air, but, but that's what happened. But I definitely wanted to keep it, I didn't, here was the goal, present it to a broad audience and make it a hit, but not, we did not want to disappoint the comic book fans. Well, in order not to disappoint the comic book fans, we couldn't aim it down. We couldn't turn it into a kiddie show we had to keep it as sophisticated and dramatic where appropriate as possible. And that's what, what my vision was. And that's what we did. So Margaret, you joined Marvel productions just to give our listeners some background. 
1984. Correct. What was the vibe like in the office when you joined Marvel Productions as CEO back then? Challenging. It was <laughs> challenging. Um, Marvel Productions had been uh, started by a group, uh, an animation company called DePatty Freeling. DePatty Freeling was a show that I had, I mean, it was a company that I had experience with because years before when I was with NBC, they were suppliers to us and I bought, we bought shows from them. And so I had a relationship with Frizz Freeling and David DePatty. They were known for their comedy, Pink Panther and other such shorts and regular programming. Um, when I got there, the, David DePatty, the founder of DePatty Freeling, who was the, the person who, when they started Marvel Studios, they put that effort into DePatty Freeling and changed the name to Marvel Productions. He was getting ready to retire. As a matter of fact, he had announced his retirement when they came after, came to me when I was at Hanna-Barbera and offered me the position. I walked into that job very naive, to tell you the truth. Um, I had been at Hanna-Barbera for five years, and I loved every minute of it. I had a wonderful team. We had great success. Uh, my first real big hit, I shouldn't say my, our first, well, it was my first big hit, not Hanna-Barbera's, was the Smurfs. I was having a lot of fun with that show. I love the Smurfs. Thank you for I that. Did, I did, too. You're welcome. I did, too. And... Um, you know, we had a great team and I fought, uh, well, you fight for everything, you know, in the Smurfs, um, the network wanted us to not have classical music and they wanted us to add a laugh track and I wouldn't do it. And uh, as a matter of fact, when we delivered the show, Fred Silverman had specifically told me change the music and put in a laugh track. And we delivered the show without a laugh track and the same music. And of course, it was almost an instant hit. So I, <laughs> I was sweating bullets about that because I thought, well, once again, I put my job on the line, but it worked. Uh, but so I left Hanna-Barbera, a place I loved, and I worked for Joe and Bill directly. I had a, a writing team of 32 writers. Can you imagine a staff of 32 writers today? Uh, we had great producers. It was just a great operation. And then I go to Marvel, which is uh, transitioning from the old DePatty Freeling to Marvel. David DePatty is leaving, the president, the CEO is leaving, and, and Frizz, Freeling, Frizz Freeling was, was going to be there, who I knew. But it was a challenging environment because at the same time I moved over there, I had started to become a Marvel fan from the comics and from exploring properties and meeting with Stan Lee while I was at Hanna-Barbera, who would come in and pitch to us. But at the same time, Marvel itself was having trouble getting their properties produced on any meaningful scale in Hollywood. There was an attitude that I confronted head on. Several network executives actually said this to me. They said, Nobody is interested in comic book characters. Uh, they're just for nerdy 18-year-old boys who don't, really <laughs> watch, who don't really watch TV and aren't our audience. So that was the climate. So I came over to a company that was going through transition, wasn't having a lot of success in selling their properties because of this attitude. And I left a place where I loved and was had been successful. So I was nervous. And I was a bit naive about how difficult it would be to sell Marvel properties. I found out the hard way. It was very difficult. It was very challenging. And ultimately, my biggest success while at Marvel was the Muppet Babies. Um, you know, I, I had pursued that for a long time, the property. That's another story. But um, so I, I, they were welcoming to me, but the climate was challenging. The attitude of the networks was challenging. I went from a place, Hanna-Barbera, where we 
we had shows on every network. We were the dominant production company in the business to this smaller company that was going through a challenging transition. And uh, I had my work cut out for me. I, so I want to ask a follow-up question, right? And, and I have a statement. One, I think what's been evident in your career is that you've taken these big risks and they've paid off greatly, you know, when you were making that transition to Marvel Productions, but then also when you went to Fox Kids, everyone was telling you not to do it and you still did it and you went up against all the odds. So thank you for being a hashtag girl boss because honestly, that level of courage, I mean... Here we are today talking about it. This well, it, I, you know, I was nervous sometimes. There's no question about it. I, I didn't like risking everything, but I felt, what else could I do? You know, I, <laughs> I figured if I put my job on the line, they might let me do something. <laughs> so <laughs> and then some otherwise. <laughs> a follow-up question before I kick it to Daryl. What are you at liberty to say? what Stanley was coming to pitch to you when you were at Hanna-Barbera? Sure. Um, several things. We, the thing was one of them. And we produced the thing. We, I, I'm trying to remember whether it was a series of shorts in another show or whether it was its own half hour. I think it was its own half hour. It wasn't the only thing he pitched. He pitched a lot of shows, but for some reason, I think that, well, that was the show we could interest the network on. You know, it's not always up to us. We're, we're out there pitching every idea we have, and you never know what the buyer is going to pick up. So uh, Stan came in, and, um, you know, he was quite a character. As a matter of fact, Joe Barbera just didn't know what to make of Stan, and he kind of just... That he's yours. You, you. <laughs> I mean, he was very gracious to him. Obviously, he had respect for Stan, but he didn't quite understand Stan, and he certainly wasn't. Uh, Joe wasn't particularly plugged into the that world of action adventure. But um, Stan pitched a number of properties. As I said, we ended up with a thing, which was uh, an unusual. I thought it was a, an odd pick by the network. And I don't think we did more than one season, if I recall correctly. I'd have to check that. I So I'm looking on Wikipedia right now. I didn't know this existed. Daryl, did you know it existed? But there's a Fred and Barney meet the thing. We tried I had no idea. Things. <laughs> That's, that, I had no idea in the three decades of my fandom. I've never known this existed. And now I know what I'm going to do the rest of my night. Yeah. yeah. I, and, uh, Good luck. <laughs> and something that Dayspring here and I have discussed is sort of how characters are really popular. And during that time frame, The Thing is a character that Marvel was really pushing. So I can see why that was picked up, because it was the hot character of that moment. There were years where Ben Grimm, The Thing, was the go-to character before the Wolverines of the world came around. You had Ben Grimm. So uh, that makes so much sense that that is something that went into development and went out into the world. Yeah, and I think that part of that uh, uh, trend at the time probably was inspired by the success of The Hulk, which had been a primetime show. The Thing, The Hulk, they just viewed the networks, you know, this giant character. So, yeah, I, the, the network picked that for us to do. I mean, we presented several projects, including that, but they picked it. You but have I don't, an episode. I, Sorry. Yeah. I, I don't think we did more than one season. I just don't. I, I have to check. I don't remember. Sorry. No, don't apologize. It, it looks like you only did one season. And one of your episodes here, it's called To Thing or Not To Thing. Yeah, it would be corny. <laughs> so um, why don't we transition to Pride of the X-Men? Because this is really the prototype for the entire animated series. Um, so uh, I think Dayspring and I are wondering, how did that come to be? I mean, before you would just see X-Men as cameos in other shows, but um, how did an actual production involving just mutant characters come around? Well, um, 
Pride of the X-Men was really a result of our frustration. It was a result of our frustration of not being able to sell the series. Stan and I went out every year, every season, and pitched several properties. Spider-Man, always new Spider-Man episodes, and we pitched X-Men because we believed. We also pitched the Avengers quite a bit. Uh, there were some holdbacks to us being able to pr always present the Avengers and several other Marvel properties because Marvel Comics had made some theatrical deals with uh, a movie company. And so we didn't have access to all those rights. We had to work around that. But the, and that left us basically with, with what I considered prime properties, X-Men and Spider-Man. And Stan and I literally couldn't give away the properties. We, wow. I, I, as a matter of fact, I was reminiscing Years after I left Marvel, I was I saw Jim Galton, who had been the president of Marvel Entertainment and my boss. Marvel Entertainment included the comic book company, the distribution company, and Marvel Productions. And I said to Jim, I guess I wasn't a great CEO of Marvel Productions. And he, he was smoking a cigar at the time, and he took the cigar out of his mouth and he says, tell me about it. <laughs> but then we went on to talk about how Muppets turned Muppet Babies turned out to be our most successful show during my stay there. Uh, well, and with and our Hasbro relationship was very successful with GI Joe and Transformers and Jim and so forth. But uh, out of frustration, I honestly don't remember. I'd like to give credit where it is due. I don't want to take credit if it's not mine. It could have been that I suggested this. I really don't remember whose idea it was, but we came up with the notion of doing one less episode of Robocop. We were doing an animated Robocop and we decided to do one less episode and take that money and put it into a pilot. And I, I always believed if you made it, if you kept trying to sell something, and no one got it. If you could make it and show it to them, they'd believe in it. That was my theory anyway. So we scraped together the money and we put together a team, which was excellent, of course, to do the animated uh, Pride of X-Men. And that's how it, 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 the whole purpose of this was to have a vehicle to go out and sell it, to prove to the networks once and for all, I was going to prove to the networks that this show could be a hit. And we didn't prove it. <laughs> we didn't prove it. And there, there's some, there was a, a lot of back and forth on the creative aspects of that show, but we did the best we could under the circumstances of limited budget uh, and, and trying to come up with a showcase to work for us. I, I think it actually did pave the way for X-Men, the animated series, uh, because there are things we learned as after doing it, but that's how it came about. And it we still couldn't sell the X-Men series as a result. As a matter of fact, we, we couldn't interest any network in even airing it. So I think we finally resorted to um, video, release on video initially. And then I think, I'm, and then we put it, we put it in our syndicated block. Yes, uh, you did. Yeah, that's right. We put it in the syndicated block, which was also a rationale for how we could further justify doing it. Um, but as I said, it kind of laid the groundwork because it, of the people we worked with, the team that we had, and, and we thought it worked fine, but nobody else did. Well, you know, Margaret, I'm sorry to hear that because I think I can speak for Daryl where we wore out those VHS teams. <laughs> I thought it, it did not look like you had to scrape together a budget. The Toei animation, Toei, who would go on to do such popular animes like Sailor Moon, did right. it. It looked beautiful. I mean, they, they were the great. show looked beautiful. Toei did a great They always did a great job. They were expensive for us, but they did a great job. We trusted them and they were excellent. And they always added to the show, which was wonderful. Anything they did, they, they raised the bar. Uh, you know, when you go through the animation process, it's so labor intensive and there's so many steps involved that oftentimes the greatest 
quality is at the writing and the storyboard stage. And then it goes down from there because you lose money. You, I mean, because of money and time. But Toei always managed to keep it up or bring it up more, which was fantastic. Can, can I ask a, a question? So one of the things I love about Pride is that animation. I thought it looked so great. Had, let's just say, in an alternate universe, Pride had really taken off. Would you have been able, knowing how expensive they are, would you have been able to sustain them to do every episode? Or would you have just had someone else come in and do the animation? And maybe they just do the opening, you know, intro to the show. At the time, I think what we would have done is worked out a deal with Toei that attached them to the series to do it as long as they could meet it a certain budget. Because one of my sentiments is that you don't create something and go out and pitch it and then change the qualitative level when you sell it. That's like a no-no. You're misrepresenting what you're going to do. Um, I've seen people do it, not very much, but they'll put together a very elaborate presentation piece and the series doesn't look anything like it. And no, I think we would have worked out a deal with Toei to deliver that quality. Well, they did in G.I. Joe. Yeah. And they did in, in you know, in, in the years that we did Transformers there and, and G.I. Joe. Uh, it, it was expensive, as I said, but... Uh, we worked out an arrangement with them. And uh, so I, they were wonderful. They were, they were wonderful to work with. They were the best at the time. Then your time at Marvel comes to an end. So walk us through leaving Marvel and then going to Fox. Um, because I think you were advised to not go over there, but you did and it worked out. So uh, what was yeah. that transition like for you personally and professionally? Well, the transition turned out to be very challenging because when I was working for Marvel, we were sold three times over the six years, six little over six years. And um, the last owner when I was at Marvel was a Wall Street success by the name of Ron Perlman. He was now the owner of Marvel. We had been sold by New World Pictures to him. I was approached by Fox. But one of the animation companies actually recommended Fox. They, they knew that Fox was out looking for someone to start a children's network. Fox Children's Network was the name of it. And uh, one of our the industry producers, Andy Hayward, who's still in the business, Andy Hayward said to... Fox, I think you should consider Margaret Lesh. I didn't know anything about this at the time. I, I was happy at Marvel, although we were struggling with the new, having changed ownership several times. So when they, when Fox did offer me the job, which was uh, quite a surprise to me, I went to my boss, Jim Galton, and um, he informed me after a series of conversations that they, that Ron Perlman did not want me to be released from my contract. Now the craziness of that, I, I can, I mean, I was under contract. I had another year left. This was 1989 when I was offered the job. And, uh, but the, the craziness of my being offered the job and not able to take it was that I was going to become a buyer. And Marvel Comics' position was, she's going to be a buyer. What? <laughs> Let her out of the contract. <laughs> well, they wouldn't. That's why Fox Kids, well, we I changed it to Fox Kids. Fox Kids Network didn't start until 1990 because I was held up. So for 11 months, I was at Marvel knowing I would be at at Fox, and that was very challenging because obviously I'm trying to remain loyal to Marvel and focus on Marvel business, and yet I'm having to plan and think about going forward. And, uh, and, and of course, I had discussions with my own team at Marvel. When I get to Fox, I'm going to put X-Men and Spider-Man on. We're going to do it the way we want. And we, 
but it was it was a frustrating start. And yes, uh, one of my several of my network colleagues said to me, Margaret, you're making a huge mistake. You're going to Fox. They're you know they're like a not not a real successful network. What are you doing? You're throwing away your career. You you've got all these Emmy awards and other awards in the business, and and you're you're nuts to do this. But it was certainly tempting to become a buyer. You know, I'd started my career at ABC and then NBC, and I knew the network side, and I, I felt if I could start, a, I, I, I had a vision of what another network could look like based on the vision that Fox had. Jamie Kellner and Barry Diller were instrumental in the starting of Fox Kids Network and a Fox Children's Network. And, um, and I thought they were right, that there was a real opportunity for us. But anyway, the long-winded answer to the question is it was a frustrating and agonizing 11-month wait uh, to get started. And then you did get started. And it sounds like your ideas that you brought with you, you've had for a while at that point. So you had Spider-Man and X-Men in your back pocket. How did you activate the idea for X-Men? So you're finally there. You you have the latitude to do it. How did you do it? Well, it turns out I didn't have as much latitude to do it as I had thought. I, what I did is I called up Stan Lee and I said, Sam, now that I'm here, let's do X-Men and then Spider-Man. I want to do X-Men first. Uh I'm not sure why I wanted to do X-Men first. I think because it had become so challenging that I just wanted to get it over the line, over the goal line. I said, let's do X-Men and let's do it the way we envisioned it, the way we want to do it, the real way, our way. Yeah. <laughs> and of course he was thrilled and it started that simply. Later, however, when I was pitching it to my boss, the president of Fox Network, he was not as enchanted with the idea as I would have hoped. He thought the show was risky and that it was dark. It was esoteric. It was, I, I had sent him some comics and told him about the concept, obviously. Um, he was not uh, fully on board with it and uh, didn't share my enthusiasm. And it became a, uh, a real stressful situation for me. And ultimately I did put my job on the line because I believed in it so much. So uh, I don't recall going back to Stan and Marvel and telling him the problems I was having internally. I tried to absorb it. I didn't want to worry them, uh, but I was worried. But I put a great program executive on it, Sydney Iwater, who had we had worked together for years, and Sydney understood and shared the vision and brought a lot of his own creativity to the project with Eric and Julia, and um, the rest is history. How did Eric and Julia get involved on the project? I think Sydney may have originally recommended them to me. Um, that's my recollection. I'd have to ask him to tell you the truth. And, and did you work with Larry at Marvel Productions? Yes. Larry Parr? Oh, oh Larry, Larry Houston. Houston. Larry yeah. Houston. Larry Houston. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I loved Larry Houston. I thought, you know, these, these guys, they were all guys, to tell you the truth, uh, a little different today. These fellows were so talented and so humble. They were never one to, to be looking for the glory and looking for the credit, but they deserve a lot of the glory and a lot of the credit. Um, they were quiet, hardworking, diligent. They were always in communication with Marvel Comics, which was great. They were well thought of by Marvel Comics, but they were just wonderful to have on board because they were problem solvers. And uh, I had worked with, I worked with Will in particular when I was at Hanna-Barbera. I don't remember what the project, what projects they were. And um, 
Larry, I got to know quite well, and I'm fans of both of them. You know, a follow-up question I have about, you know, when you were sort of absorbing sort of the internal politics that you were getting and not really bringing it back to Stan, was your relationship with Stan. And, you know, of course, we've read the Lee Waltz books. I've seen some of the interviews you've done online talking about Stan. But something that's kind of evident to me right here is that you had a relationship with Stan for almost over a decade, you know, by yeah. the time you were pitching X-Men. And you said something that I thought was really interesting, that you said the secret sauce between your relationship with Stan is that you were curious and he was enthusiastic. And I'm, I'm wondering, what did you mean by that, if you can unpack it, especially in the context of doing, like, a show like X-Men? Well, it... I always would ask Stan why or how he thought of something. Uh, and I was always struck by the fact that his curiosity had led him to a lot of ideas. His thinking about, you know, Stan was a very deep thinker. I don't think most people realize that. He was quite a philosopher. I do know that Marvel knows that because a lot of the philosophy is is demonstrated in his programming but Stan had a lot to say about things you can anything you pick Stan knew something about it often because he was so curious he was well read he was informed he was interested so when you're when I was talking to him about any of his characters or how did you what made you think of this or what were you trying to say or how did you come up with this idea he would re relate what led, it was always out of curiosity that he would explore something and then get an idea. Now, that's not to diminish that many of his ideas came in some ways from Jack Kirby. And he always, it was interesting, Stan always gave Jack Kirby credit to me. I think a lot of people in the industry don't recognize that. They Sometimes they think that Stan took the credit, but he, Stan always in my presence gave Jack a lot of credit. But Stan intellectually was a reader and, uh, as I said, a very interested citizen of the world. He was well-read on politics. He had a lot of opinions about it. Um, and, and he was enthusiastic about his ideas. So I'm curious. I was always asking him questions. How did you do this? Why did you do that? And, and he would get, as he would tell me, I could tell what, what he really believed and what excited him the most by his level of enthusiasm. And that would get me hooked. I think that's why I got so hooked on X-Men because he was hooked on X-Men. And he was frustrated that he couldn't get interest in X-Men in theatrical or television. And that's wild because the comics really took off in the 80s. You know, the, 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 they were they were huge. And especially, I mean, I think by the time we get to the X-Men animated series, I mean, but the Jim Lee relaunch, everyone was talking about that. I'm just, it's so baffling to me that you guys had such an uphill battle. Yes. And that really boils down to the perception of Marvel comics was that it was for older, for young men, it was dark, it was esoteric, it was violent. Those were all of the adjectives that were associated with Marvel. So you walk into a children's programming department at a network and they go, oh, too talky. When they say esoteric, they also meant talky because you'd, you, know, you, could, you had, can all have a, all kinds of dialogue on the comic, it's not slowing you down, but in television, it may. So they thought it was too talky, too dark, too esoteric, too violent. And they thought it was too, they didn't think it was age appropriate. Now, that goes to the heart of what I believed, and that is you shouldn't talk down to kids. I mean, when when Chuck Jones was doing The Roadrunner and Frizz Freeling was doing, you know, Sylvester and Tweety, some of what they did was really sophisticated, but it was funny as could be. And we all laughed, kids and adults. That's what I believed. I didn't believe, I knew that Frizz Freeling and Tex Avery and Chuck Jones and Joe Barbera and Bill Hanna, none of them ever did animation 
talking down to kids. They were trying to make each other laugh. They were trying to outdo each other. The battles between all those directors was infamous. And the stories they used to tell about how to undermine each other. They were trying to out, and outdo in gags, outdo in funny walks, outdo with funny characters. This was for them, as well as the audience. They weren't talking down to anybody. So Marvel Comics sort of, even though it wasn't comedy, it personified the attitude of being sophisticated for the for the audience, so much so that the networks thought it was too adult, too dark, too dramatic. I wanted to bring drama into children's programs. You know, one of my favorite programs as a child, and don't ask me why, because we all watch this, The Glass Menagerie. I think it was a Hallmark Hall of Fame. A lot of those were very sophisticated stories. But as a family, we all watched them and enjoyed them, and they stuck with me. So, and then you'd go to the, the theater and you'd watch these animated shorts that were hilarious. Again, not talking down to kids. Uh, that really created my belief that kids deserve the same quality and the same sophistication, if you will. Uh, as as anybody else. Now, I'm not denigrating shows like Sesame Street, which are designed for preschool, very young toddler age children. They do a brilliant job. They do the job that's needed. But our shows were targeted to older kids. Thank you for not talking down to us growing up, because I have always credited the X-Men animated series for my ability to understand very complex themes of otherness or just deciphering stories. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I would go on to, to be an English major. I would go on to be working in publishing. And I had that level of comprehension because of the work you did, because you did not talk down to me as a child. And I feel like well, so many of us feel that way. Well, thank you. You know, one of the reasons that I was such a fan of X-Men is because I felt it dealt with such compelling themes that we should all learn. And that has to do with the issues. You know, X-Men is very much about uh, acceptance of differences, tolerance, understanding, right. racial acceptance, um, all these important issues. And it was delivered in such an interesting package that I felt that it was worthwhile to do. That's one of the reasons I fought for it. I thought it was an important show, not just a good show. It was important because of the themes that we dealt with. And the themes were delivered in a brilliant way by our writers. Well, and you know, the Leewald said this to us when we had them on the show. They said it was very important for them to do the Sentinels in those first few episodes because they wanted to show that the government was hunting down the mutants and that by the time we meet Magneto, who's the main antagonist, he may not be wrong in his position. And that when you start that it's, it's sort of that, that Grendel theory where you see the, the story from the monster's perspective and maybe the monster, there is a reason why he's like that. Right. And you just laid that foundation for us as viewers. And you would go on to tell such great stories like we were, we were talking to Lenore Zan at San Diego Comic-Con. We had her on a panel and she loved the line, there ain't no cure for who you are. She, yeah, well, it, I mean, right. how powerful that is. And, you know, I was talking to her and she just looked at me and she said that, you know, when she was reading her scripts and, and all that stuff. And you can just see the goosebumps on her. Absolutely. I mean, and that's why it's such a great show because it has lines like that. Um, the writing I thought was unparalleled in many ways. We had, you know, we just had, we captured it and magic in a bottle. I have a, a series of questions and it may have some similar answers, but it's about the X-Men characters themselves. And it, you got to know them through comics um, for years before bringing this to the screen. You're familiar with them. Right. So of course I have a, who is your favorite X-Men and X-Villain but also, which one were you most excited to bring to the screen? Wow. Yeah. Which one was I most excited to bring to the screen? 
Um, Margaret, the only appropriate answer is Jean Grey because we I are know, big Jean Grey fans here. I well, I'm a, well, who isn't a Jean Grey fan? I mean, she's a great character. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, she is a great character, and her her story, uh, you know, ultimately is so riveting. Um, well, certainly Jean Grey. Now, I thought you thought I was going to say Jean Grey because she's a girl, but it's that's not that's. Yes, she is a girl, but that's not it, of course. Um, Jean Grey and Wolverine are my two favorite characters for, for many different reasons. Wolverine, I know he's mean. I know he comes across as angry and mean, but I've always seen, I've always believed that there's another side to Wolverine that has great depth and, and, and sentiment, that he's sentimental. Mm -hmm. But he'll be the last to ever admit it in a gazillion years. It might surprise you who my favorite villain is. Um, probably Dark Phoenix. Oh, Ooh, yeah. yeah. We love yeah. that here. We're big Jean Grey fans here. Yeah, I mean, she it's such a great story. And, uh, you know, have so much packed into it. There are a lot of good, I mean, Juggernaut's an interesting villain. Uh, there, there are a lot of interesting. But who, uh, uh, Graydon Creed, Graydon Creed, wasn't that? Oh my God! It, mm -hmm. it, the, another one that stood out for me. Well, you know that's the thing about X Men. There's so many characters that you can love, but those are the ones that originally excited me. Can I ask you why is Hank McCoy, aka the Beast, the worst character in all of X Men history? But you guys somehow made him so lovable on the show. Well, you can give credit to the writers there. Okay, I mean, they did that. They they did that, and um, and I'm happy about that. <laughs> One thing I'm curious about, and I've seen you say this in past interviews, and I've heard certain certain comments from Lenore and everyone else on the on the production side, was you really didn't know the success of the show. I mean, I think you said you had your ratings and that's it, but you didn't really you know see the longevity for it. Why was that? We, 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 was fan mail not pouring in for you guys? It's you. You know, uh, I need to set the stage for you of what the '90s was like for us, for me, and for us. We were delivering some terrific programming and getting <clears throat> tons of letters from kids because we had something called the Fox Kids Club. So we had a forum for kids to respond to us. Oh, I remember the Fox Kids Club. Believe me, it was amazing. I remember one day getting off the elevator to our offices and the, the, the lobby area was filled with, filled with sacks and sacks. And I said to the young lady who was there, I said, what is all this? She says, fan mail. I said, fan mail? She says, yeah. Well, I started reading. I would pick up every day. I'd grab a handful and read them. And it was illuminating, obviously, and it was rewarding. But that's what you would think was going on. Here was my life, our life. Every day, some social scientist or press person would say, Fox Kids, Margaret Lesh, whoever they would pick, is contributing to uh, damaging the children of America. Boo, uh, no. Uh, where, no. you know, I False. literally was told by, by Congress that I was ruining the American youth by the programming that I was putting on, violence and so forth. Um, we were being beaten up constantly. I testified before Congress several times. It seemed numerous times to me. It may have only been several. Uh, we were always being criticized um, it was not the environment that you think that we would be basking in glory. We, we weren't being basked in glory. We were being skewered <laughs> constantly. And I think that's what my boss originally, the one that wasn't enthusiastic about X-Men, where I had to put my job on the line, to be fair to him, he anticipated that I would get a lot of criticism, and we did. Uh, and and it, it probably was... Uh, 
because of a combination of elements. I mean, we were doing X-Men, then I was doing Batman, the animated series, and then Power Rangers. And so we kind of got, uh, because of the, because of the more than one, we were getting beat, beaten up more, more often than anybody. Um, that's the side of success that's challenging because I was constantly being criticized. So when I, after I, years, years go by, you know, several years after I left Fox, I was starting to hear from fans about how much they loved our shows. And I was, I remember saying to the first few fans, what? You mean you're a, whatever they are, you're a lawyer and I didn't ruin you? You got like a gang member, a killer? I, I was told I was ruining the youth of America. So we didn't really know what our impact was. We knew the show was popular. We knew our shows were popular, but uh, we, I was so relieved <laughs> that all the fans were, were celebrating what we did and not being ruined by what we did. Because, you know, if you're criticized enough, you start to believe it. Yeah, but I, I think that history has absolutely borne you and your vision out and your persistence with it, that um, all the fans that I run across and... Paul, maybe you share in the sentiment that everyone who was really into the X-Men and everything that you were producing back then are really tolerant, wonderful people that it really showed them, as it did with Paul, how to look at life and how to see a story um, and to persevere. I mean, that's the ultimate story of the X-Men not only with you bringing the animated series to life, but also their whole existence is perseverance. So yeah. um, it was rather short-sighted of some of your peers back then to be so negatively critical of it. Because it, if you look at it now, 30 years on, this is something that is such a large part of people's lives and did so much good. And it's just unfortunate that they didn't see that back then. And it's unfortunate that you received so much criticism that it sort of veiled it from you at times as well. Yes. I mean, thank you for that statement. I think, I think you're right that this really, you know, ultimately I felt that a show like X-Men was going to be uplifting to kids because again, what it's really about is harassment of people who are different. Now, what kid in school or anywhere hasn't felt different? You know, my father was in the service, as I said, and every, seemed like every year, certainly every couple of years, I was the new kid on the block going into a new school. What a feeling of being, you know, overwhelmed and outnumbered and uh, sticking out like a sore thumb. I mean, you always feel like the oddball. And, you know, you work hard to, to try to fit in, but you don't really totally fit in because you're the new kid on the block, always. So I understood to some degree what a lot of kids were feeling in their own insecurities and this show addressed it. I thought it was a very, as I said, it was a drama, but it was an uplifting one because of what it taught, tolerance, understanding, you know. Uh, and it also, one of the things that I thought was interesting about X-Men is it showed restraint because some of the powers that they have and some of the behavior that they had, they would often have to restrain themselves. And that's a lesson too. So um, it was very gratifying to hear from the fans after, especially after I left, to hear from the fans about how much they loved and how the show connected with the audience, which is exactly what I had hoped because it's what it did for me. I connected with it. Um, so why wouldn't you connect with it and, and, and all the viewers? Um, but it, it, you know, as you know, things that are different aren't always immediately accepted. And X-Men was different. It was different from other shows that have been on the air. It took itself more seriously. Right. And I think, Early on, there was talk of Stan sort of introducing the episodes kind of like a Walt Disney style. And right. I know the Leewalds and Larry pushed back against that. And 
it sounds like it was a similar situation with the Smurfs where they wanted a laugh track, you know what right, I mean? Like, right. You know, I, I'll tell you, I, it wasn't really Stan's idea to do that. It was someone else's idea. I don't remember whose it was. Interesting. Stan would do whatever Stan needed to do. You know, he, he was a good, he was very co cooperative and, but um, no, I, I remember those discussions and uh I'm happy we didn't do it with Stan. Stan turned out to be a huge cheerleader of the show. I, I've read a lot of online, a lot of criticism that Stan was against the show, but he wasn't. Um, clearly, you know, we listen, part of my philosophy in dealing with, with the creative team is to, the, my job is to set them up to succeed. So I fight the fights, I fight the battles, and I let them as long as I feel that it creatively is in the right direction, I would give them as much leeway as possible because I've always found that people rise to the occasion when given the responsibility. And uh, I've had very few exceptions to that over my career. I've seen very few exceptions. Most people do rise to the occasion. So I, my philosophy was put really good programming executives on the show, like Sydney Iwander, who were great with writers. And, let them do their thing. They're better than I am. I'm not the writer. They're the writer or they're the producer. My job is to create an environment in which they can succeed. And my job is to protect them. And it was very articulated to me early on when I was working with Jim Henson. Jim called me up one night. We were having a discussion about something. And, and he was upset about uh, a he was upset about a communication that he had from a network executive. And I said, how can I help you? He said, fight my battles. I said, you got it. And that kind of uh, c clarified to me what my role was in the business. And that's what I always did. I had done it before, but I didn't ever think about it. It just came naturally that I would protect my team. But once he said that, then I understood he's a creator. I need to create an, I need to give him an environment in which he can succeed and keep, keep all the stuff away from him that will pull him down. And that's what I did. And that's what I did with my team. Margaret, we're so happy you are a fighter. I, you know, it baffles me to hear the story of the backlash you, you got in those early nineties. Because I'm thinking of Power Rangers, you know, oh. the theme that there is strength in diversity. There is power in friendship. You have Batman. You you had the X-Men. I mean, you were keeping the toy industry. You were keeping the U.S. economy afloat. <laughs> I remember <laughs> well, going to Toys R Us. I didn't do it by myself, that's for sure. <laughs> I went to Toys R Us, and they are never they, they did not have any of the Power Ranger toys. There was like a moment in the early 90s where there was nothing, and there were signs at Toys R Us that said, we have no Power Ranger toys. Do not ask. It's true. It's true. As a matter of fact, Power Rangers was an interesting, I don't want to get us off the key, but here off out of you know out of sync here but power rangers was a phenomenal success that nobody anticipated so much so that we were having an event at universal shortly after the show premiered we were having a an event at universal studios where the power rangers would be on the stage and kids would come in this the event i think happened a month or two after the show premiered and i was in my office in hollywood and I got a call from someone and they said, do you have any idea what's going on over here? I'm like, over where? And said, well, we're, we're on the way to the universal event. I was gonna go too that afternoon. And they said, and the freeway is dead. It's completely stopped because of a traffic jam. And I said, what's that got to do with Power Rangers? He says, they're all going to universal. It's closed the Hollywood freeway. I said, what? <laughs> it, it hit that fast. I mean, it was so huge. So Toy, a Bandai rather, they were completely caught on a, off guard that this show would be so instantly successful that they hadn't shipped all the toys yet. So their toys weren't there. And believe me, we heard a lot about that. 
I, I just wanted the Pink Ranger. I just needed Kimberly Hart. Could not track her down. I remember the Christmas morning, I finally saw like the triangle shaped box under the tree and I opened it up and it was Jason. I was like, no, I wanted Kimberly. So, oh, that's so funny. So, so thank you for giving me context for that. You're welcome. <laughs> but give it, getting us back on track, Daryl. Yes, yeah. Back so, so back to some Marvel stuff. So, um, after the fourth season, Fantastic Four then premiered alongside X-Men for its fifth season. So Fantastic Four, I love that show to this day. And I'm so glad that both of the series and Spider-Man, they're all on Disney+. Plus. And at that point, Larry Houston was assigned the task. All right, you've had great success with X-Men. Here's Fantastic Four. What stuck out to you about the Fantastic Four as a property that was something that stuck out in terms of, I want to develop that. I need to bring that to TV. I think that the market is ready for it. You know, Fantastic Four was a property that Stan and I had in our arsenal to constantly uh, sell. And we weren't successful, obviously, at the time. Uh, and I never quite understood why, because what I liked about the Fantastic Four, unlike X-Men, it was a more intimate group smaller, more intimate, and you were, uh, you could wrap your hands or your, your arms around it a little easier. And I thought it would be interesting storytelling because of those dy dynamics. And you know, I think you're right about the Fantastic Four. I mean, they're literally a family. It's, it's a family of four, so you can tell those more intimate stories correct. without having to involve a wider world. You can focus more on it, um, an interpersonal thing. And a lot of those story arcs were multiple episodes i mean dr doom went for multiple episodes where you could focus on just the tiny dynamics between some of the characters and how it builds into them at, as super beings but also just as people and wouldn't you think that that would make it easier to sell <laughs> you'd think so yeah well there you go <laughs> wrong looking back you know we we know a lot more now than we did then but uh I, th I always thought, I liked the Fantastic Four comics in particular. So, because the stories were different. And I always thought it was a good point of de departure for Marvel. A little different, something a little different. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy they were able to do it. So, I have a question. So, we, we were getting, obviously, the X-Men were, were, were a big success. We got Spider-Man. We got Iron Man. We got the Fantastic Four. Were you guys trying to build like an, an a shared animated series universe, sort of like what we see now with the Marvel movies? Or no. was it no, you weren't? No, we weren't. We weren't that smart. <laughs> well I, I, I we disagree. Did, we did we did want to make sure we weren't doing anything that was in conflict with what Marvel Comics was doing. That was a a line we walked. We were in communication constantly with Marvel Comics, especially our writers and producers were, uh, to make sure that we didn't go off in a tangent that was completely wrong. Um, but I think what the movies has done is brilliant. And obviously we would have eventually gotten there, I think. But no, we weren't, that really wasn't, all we were trying to do is be true to the, world that x-men had been, that had been created by comics we wanted to try different things and, and expand it but we didn't want to do anything that was you know so different that it didn't seem authentic um i think what as i said what the features have done is is quite wonderful you know i uh pitched x-men to the theatrical division at fox numerous times and eventually they did agree to put it into development that's when it you know i also pitched spider-man to them to and uh jim cameron was going to produce spider-man for fox but he was so tied up on titanic through a, a series of negotiations with sony and it it went away from fox but i've often oh. you know said, boy did oh. they miss an opportunity well, you know, especially James Cameron now, you know, being a little saucy about superhero movies. And yeah, yeah that, is, that is a bit of history that is forgotten because I remember Wizard Magazine had published like a fake poster of, you know, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio Spider-Man. 
and Nikki Cox as Mary Jane in a movie produced by James Cameron because that was that right. was a rumor at the time that he right. was going to do the Spider Man movie. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was set to do that. And as a matter of fact, I had an interesting discussion with him. I think we were on a plane together. I don't know if it was a Fox plane. I don't remember why I was sitting near him, but. Um, we started talking about the movie. I was very excited. I think he knew that I was the one that had been pitching Spider-Man to the theatrical division to do it. Not, not for me to do it, for them to do it. I was saying, look, we're having this great success. Um, and and he, so he pitched me, the, he was going to tell the, uh, redo the origin story, which I was very happy about, that he had the vision to, to do the origin story as the first Spider-Man, because I thought that was the right thing to do. Uh, he was very enthusiastic about it. And then, you know, months later, I found out that, no, he had, it had been traded to Sony, that they'd worked out a deal because he is, because of Titanic, he wasn't available at the time. And anyway, it didn't work out. Would have been an interesting world if Fox had also been able to do Spider-Man. Do you, do you remember what some of the early pitches for X-Men looked like or who you had conversations with, just out of curiosity? No, you know, I... Uh, pitched X-Men hard to the theatrical division. And then once they got interested, they're, they don't want me around. That's you know, it. They're I mean, like, thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. You're, you're in kids TV. When you <laughs> go away. So I had no involvement in, in either movie, but I feel proud that I, the people inside Fox know that I'm the one that pushed to do the franchise, to have theatrical also get the rights, which they did to their credit. They did get the rights to X-Men and had the rights for Spider-Man for a while. But um, it's a totally different division. And what they did was, with X-Men was terrific. So but I wasn't involved. There was a, an, an X-Men series that I pushed for and did and wasn't successful. And so it's, you know, not everything that Margaret touches turns to gold. Uh, and that was a, a favorite comic of mine was Silver Surfer. And we did the Silver Surfer series. One of the one of the challenges for Silver Surfer is that Marvel had wanted us to make sure we produced it in a way that helps sell toys and a lot of involvement from the toy people. I'm not blaming them, but I'm just saying that we had a lot of involvement from the toy people. It may have been that Silver Surfer, you know, that always the challenge was he was a lone character. And it's one thing to read thought bubbles when you're reading a comic, but it's another thing to always have a voiceover thinking in an animation cartoon. It may not have served the, served the show very well to do that. So it wasn't successful. It looked good, but it wasn't successful. I was disappointed in that, but that's the way it goes. Were there any unproduced um, X-Men spinoffs or shows that after the X-Men took off that you had wanted to do that had been pitched, but just for whatever reason never came into fruition? Well, I always wanted to do the Avengers. Uh, but I think I became satisfied with my Marvel goals through X-Men because we could keep expanding and having other villains come in from the Marvel world. And then um, our last question yeah. is, obviously, you have created a legacy, um, and X-Men 97 is coming out next year. So uh, are you looking forward to it? Do you have any hopes or aspirations for what may be involved with that? Um, listen, I have to admit that when I read that they were going to do it, I had a little pang. I don't think it was a pang of jealousy. I think it, let me think about it a minute. I think it was a pang of nostalgia and wishing, wishing that I could be involved. But realistically, it's not going to happen. They have a very strong team over there. And I was delighted that they made a deal with Eric and Julia. Delighted. I think that was a smart thing to do. And, uh, and they're, apparently they're such fans that I think they're going to try to do it right. So I feel after the, I got over the pang, then I started feeling proud and, and happy. And I, I just hope it's everything it could be and inspires another generation of kids. So. Oh, that's such a perfect answer. Margaret, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. 
Is there somewhere where fans can hit you up and let the, let you know how happy they are with all the programs you provided for them growing up? Do you have a Instagram, Twitter, Facebook page? I have a, I'm on Facebook. I don't, I'm not very active on Facebook, but I do read it. I don't respond very much because I, I, that's just my personality. I'm kind of try to not always be in, <laughs> I try to be in the background a little bit, but um, they can reach me through Facebook and um, I'll think about it. I, I don't have Instagram and I'm not on Twitter. I'm a mm. Neanderthal. <laughs> no, I, don't go and, to Twitter. And I'm sure that Paul can forward any comments that people send in to yeah, the Power of X-Men great. account too. That yeah. would be great. That would be great. Uh, Everyone's going to be so well, excited. thank you for your interest. And as I've said before, see, what's so gratifying to me about this is you two. I didn't ruin you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. We grew up you're, to be well adjusted. You're delightful young men, and you're very successful, and I'm, I'm happy you're so happy. Yes. Well, well, Margaret, you know, it's so funny. I, I remember the first time I got into a disagreement with someone. And someone was like, oh, that X-Men cartoon show is just for kids. And I was like, no. And they were and they were fighting me back on it. And I go, you know that opening sequence, Jubilee is running from a mob that probably wants to murder her. And she grabs onto the fence and you see the terror in her eyes. And that did not ruin me as a kid. That taught me lessons. That, that I, I was able to process that. And use that as an adult growing up, you know, much like Daryl as well. So See, thank love, you for I what you did. Hearing, I love hearing that because that's what we hoped. We didn't know, but that's what we hoped. That's what we hoped would, would happen. That kids would. And I, you know, Stan was a great believer in that too. I remember very early on when I first met Stan, I said to him, what gave you the idea of answering your fan mail uh, with Excelsior? He said, well, I said, he said, it's a very jubilant, uplifting word. And I wanted kids to have to look it up. He was always pushing them. He said, I always put in vocabulary that they might not know. And that that's good. That'll make them look it up. So he too was always trying to raise the bar because he didn't underestimate his audience. And I learned that from all those older men, Frizz Freeling, Tex Avery, Stan Lee, Joe Barbera, Bill Hanna, you know, all of them never underestimated their audience. They knew that a lot of kids loved what they did, but they didn't talk down to them. And that was a real lesson to me.